Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing okay. Today we'll be talking about the motor or the descending spinal pathways. So to contextualize the topic a little bit better, we'll start by talking about the basic motor system organization. We'll talk about the various components of the motor system. So we'll talk about the reflex arc. We'll talk about the differences between the upper and the lower motor neurons. We'll try to identify the upper and lower motor neurons in our motor system organization. And we'll discuss in detail about the descending spinal pathways, especially we'll be talking about the corticospinal pathway in detail. We will also mention the corticonuclear pathways within the larger picture of the motor system organization. However, we'll discuss that in detail in some separate lecture on the cranial nerves. Similarly, the place of the basal ganglia and the cerebellum would be highlighted as well within the larger context of the motor system organization, but we'll have uh, subsequent videos recorded in detail for the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. As always, we learn to apply the basic neuroanatomical information to localize the neurological lesions as part of the neurological examination. This will actually help you prepare nicely for your neurology clinical skills as well as for your upcoming hospital placements. So before we begin, let me actually give you a little, let me actually show you a little schematic which gives you a nice overview of the various components of the motor system and talks about their organization as a whole. So this is the schematic and let's try to understand this schematic which explains the entire, which explains the motor system organization as a whole. Here in the center over here, you can see the different horizontal slices which have been taken at various levels in the central nervous system. Remember, the central nervous system relates to the brain and the spinal cord. So for instance, over here, you can see, you can see a horizontal slice taken at the level of the spinal cord. And then you can see another horizontal slice at the level of the lower medulla. This is a horizontal section at the level of the upper medulla oblongata. And then moving uh, above one step, we can see a horizontal slice taken through the pons then this is the horizontal or transverse section of the midbrain shown over here then this is another horizontal slice taken at level where the thalamus and the internal capsule are situated lastly you can see a coronal or a side to side slice which has been taken through the cerebral cortex and don't worry, we'll be talking about these slices in much more detail as we go on during this lecture as well as in subsequent lectures now the basic foundation of the motor system is the reflex arc. The neuronal components which contribute to the reflex arc have been highlighted in red over here and we'll be talking about these in a little bit detail in, in a second. This reflex arc is then under the influence of the higher centers such as the cerebral cortex or several other higher centers. Now, since the reflex arc is the basic foundation of the motor system, so let me actually help uh, you understand the structural subcomponents of any reflex arc. So any reflex arc will basically be comprising of five subcomponents. Uh, a receptor, which basically receives sensory information from the external environment, and then uh, an afferent neuron or a sensory neuron, which then carries that piece of sensory information towards the central nervous system. Remember, the central nervous system could be any part of the brain or it could be any part of the spinal cord. So therefore, the third component is the central nervous system itself, which then integrates and analyzes that piece of sensory information and then the fourth component would be the efferent neuron or the motor neuron which then carries the motor command from the central integration center to some peripheral body part which would be an effector organ. The effector organ then is the fifth component of the reflex arc and this effector organ let's say could be a muscle it could be a gland which then responds to that motor command let's say by producing a muscle contraction or if it's a gland by producing a secretion or if it's a vessel wall if it's a smooth muscle in the wall of a vessel it could actually respond by vasodilatation or vasoconstriction and so on now in this schematic over here this x-shaped orientation of structure basically represents the spinal nerve the efferent neuron is shown in green over here which is the sensory neuron which is the first component which is the first or the second component of the reflex arc and you can see it carries the sensory information from some sensory receptor and travels through the ramus 
of the spinal nerve. It could be traveling through the posterior ramus or it could be traveling through the anterior ramus depending upon which part of the body is it bringing the sensory information from, from the anterior region of the body or from the posterior region of the body. And then uh, the sensory or the afferent neuron shown in green over here that's going to travel through the spinal nerve and then it's going to pass through the posterior root and then enter into the central integration center over here which is the spinal cord. This butterfly shaped region over here is the gray matter of the spinal cord. So the sensory information through the sensory or the afferent neuron is going to be brought in into the posterior gray horn of the spinal cord. Now the motor or the effector neuron then emerges from the anterior horn of the spinal cord. This efferent neuron uh, whose cell body is situated inside the anterior horn of the spinal cord that then runs inside the spinal nerve. It's going to travel through the anterior or the motor root which is shown in blue over here. This efferent neuron is shown in blue over here. It's going to be traveling through the motor root or the efferent root. It's going to then travel through the spinal nerve and then through the anterior or the posterior ramus to innervate which whichever part of the body it has to innervate, wherever the effector organ is situated in the anterior or in the posterior part of the body. So let's say if it has to go to a muscle in the posterior body wall, it's going to go through the posterior ramus. But if it has to go to an appendicular muscle in the upper limb or the lower limb, then the efferent motor neuron is going to go through the anterior ramus. And then eventually the motor command would be given to the muscle and the muscle would respond, let's say, by producing a muscle contraction. Now this efferent neuron whose cell body is situated in the anterior gray horn and that is running through the spinal nerve, this is basically our lower motor neuron. For now just remember that any neuronal lesion anywhere along the reflex arc, so anywhere along the reflex arc means that if there is a lesion in the, in the sensory or the afferent neuron or if there is a lesion in the efferent or the motor neuron or in the central integration center over there, then that would lead to a flaccid paralysis. Then what you can see over here in this schematic is that the higher centers such as the cerebral cortex, these are influencing the reflex arc. How are they influencing the reflex arc? Well, they're influencing the reflex arc through some descending neuronal pathways. These are shown in uh, red over here through these red dotted lines and these descending neural pathways are our upper motor neurons. Some of them are excitatory, some of them are inhibitory. However, the dominant effect of these upper motor neurons as a whole is inhibition. And so what you can remember right now is that since the dominant effect is inhibition, therefore the upper motor neurons, they keep the activity of this reflex arc down below in check. And therefore a lesion anywhere along the course of the central, along the course of the upper motor neurons inside the central nervous system, that would lead to a loss of this inhibition and therefore ca causing the reflex arc function to become hyper, such as hypercontraction or hyper excitability of a skeletal muscle. Therefore, an upper motor neuron lesion will lead to a spastic paralysis, meaning thereby that there will be muscle weakness, just like we had that in the lower motor neuron lesion. However, unlike the lower motor neuron lesion where we saw a flaccid paralysis, in an upper motor neuron lesion along with weakness, we'll, we'll be seeing spasticity or a spastic paralysis. Now, as part of the descending upper motor neuron pathways, we'll be talking in detail about the corticospinal tract, which has been shown over here, uh, color coded by red dotted lines. It extends all the way from the cerebral cortex down to the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord. And in the subsequent lectures, we'll talk about the corticonuclear pathways as well, which extend from the cerebral cortex shown in a color coded dotted pink line over here. It extends from the cerebral cortex and goes to the motor cranial nerve nuclei. The corticonuclear tracts, these are upper motor neuron pathways as well because they're situated inside the central nervous system and these influence the reflex arcs situated at higher levels inside the central nervous system such as in different parts of the brain stem, in the pons, in the midbrain and we'll talk about these different reflex arcs briefly as well subsequently in this lecture. Then there are other components of the motor system as well. These include the cerebellum and the basal ganglia, which you can probably appreciate here is that they are actually connected with the cerebral cortex through the neuronal loops. But what you can 
probably appreciate over here is that they don't have any direct access to the reflex arc down below. So what they can do is they can actually affect the activity of the reflex arc indirectly by modulating the activity of the cerebral cortex and that is why uh, when there is a lesion in the cerebral cortex or in the upper or the lower motor neuron pathways you can see some kind of a paralysis however if there is a lesion in the basal ganglia or the cerebellum and we'll talk about uh, that in much more detail in, in specific dedicated lectures to basal ganglia and cerebellum however for now what you have to know is that if there is a lesion in the basal ganglia or the cerebellum then the patient won't actually represent with a total paralysis in fact there would be some kind of an impairment of the uh, of the coordination of the motor activity such as the patient could be presenting with tremors or with rigidity so motor coordination would be impaired now let's talk a little bit about the significance of the reflex arc through various examples and then we'll talk about the mechanistic details of the reflex arc by th talking about things such as the stretch reflex in a bit in Okay, so one important significance of the reflex arc is that it is extremely protective in nature. Uh, for instance, what you can see over here in this illustration is that uh, once a hot object, such as a candle flame, for example, is touched accidentally, then the sensory pain receptors in the C6 or C7 dermatomal distribution, uh, they get activated and the sensory information of pain will then get transmitted over here through the sensory afferent neuron shown in red. Uh, this information is going to be transmitted through the posterior or through the anterior ramus. In this case, it will be the anterior ramus, and then the sensory afferent neuron would transmit, would, would travel through the spinal nerve and the posterior ramus to eventually enter into the posterior horn of the spinal cord. The spinal cord, in this case, is the central integration center, and that sensory information would go to the C6 or C7 spinal cord segments. Inside the gray horn, the sensory or the afferent neuron is then connected with the efferent or the motor neuron via the interneurons at those respective C6 and C7 spinal cord segments. The motor neuron then travels via the motor root. It's shown in blue over here. Uh, it's color coded in blue over here. The motor or the efferent neuron then travels via the motor root, then the spinal nerve, and then the anterior ramus to eventually enter into a peripheral nerve, which in this case would be a musculocutaneous nerve, to eventually reach the anterior arm muscles as shown in the figure over here. The arm muscles are in this case the flexor arm muscles in this case are the effector organs and consequently the effector organ would then contract the biceps for instance would contract and then moving the hand that that will move the hand and the arm away from the painful hot object. In this example of a neuronal reflex arc, the central integration center is our spinal cord and hence no conscious perception is required to undertake this activity as we don't need to involve the cerebral cortex over here for any conscious involvement. So this is extremely protective in nature because uh, we're able to use this reflex arc to move our hand away from the painful hot object even be before we consciously become aware of that hot painful object thus generating a quick response without wasting time and causing minimal damage. The knowledge of neuroanatomy of the reflex arc can then be applied as part of the neurological examination to check for the integrity of the specific spinal cord segment at that level and, and the integrity of the various components of the spinal reflex arc at that spinal cord segment level. And how do we do that? We usually do that by checking for stretch reflexes in various parts of the human body. So what is a stretch reflex? Well, when a skeletal muscle with an intact nerve supply is stretched, then the muscle contracts in order to keep its length constant. This response is called as the stretch reflex. So when I was checking for the biceps reflex, I was basically trying to hit the tendon of the bicep, which caused it and consequently the biceps muscle to stretch. The information about this change in length of the muscle was sent to the C5 or C6 spinal cord segments in the posterior horn of the spinal cord. There the information was analyzed and a motor neuron brought the motor information to the biceps muscle commanding the muscle to contract. Hence if I know the root value of the innervation of the biceps muscle then by eliciting a successful bicep stretch reflex, I can actually know that the C5 and the C6 segments of the spinal 
cord are intact and the C6 and, and C5 spinal nerves in the spinal reflex arc at that level are intact as well. Similarly, a successful triceps reflex basically tells me that the C7 spinal cord segment and the C7 spinal nerves are intact. And a successful knee jerk reflex is going to tell me that the L3 and L4 segments of the spinal cord and the L3, L4 spinal nerves are intact. In order to understand the stretch reflexes in real detail, we need to understand the anatomy of the muscle spindles and the Golgi tendon organs. Now here you're looking at an illustration of a muscle spindle. So what are muscle spindles? Well, the muscle spindles are actually sensory receptors in case of a stretch reflex, which are situated mostly inside or close to the tendon of the skeletal muscle where the muscle gets inserted into the bone. And these provide information to the CNS that is the spinal cord about the muscle length and the rate of change in the muscle length. Since the muscle spindles are more numerous towards the tendinous attachments of the muscle, that is the reason why when I was actually checking for the biceps reflex and for the triceps and all other reflexes, I was trying to hit the tendons of those muscles with my clinical hammer so that I could stretch the muscle spindles. Now, as far as the structure of a muscle spindle is concerned, each muscle spindle consists of about six to 14 intrafusal muscle fibers. And you can see the intrafusal muscle fibers over here. These intrafusal muscle fibers are surrounded by a connective tissue capsule, which is shown in green over here. The intrafusal muscle fibers then are of two types. These could be the nuclear chain fibers, such as this one shown over here, or they could be the nuclear bag fibers, uh, which is this one over shown, shown over here with the bumpy uh, center to it. These nuclear chain fibers and nuclear bag fibers, they are attached in parallel to each other, as you can see over here inside the fusiform connective tissue capsule. Now, the nuclear bag fibers are much bigger and much longer, and so therefore they extend outside the extent of the connective tissue capsule and they get attached in parallel then to the endomycium of the skeletal extrafusal muscle fiber which is shown over here. And hence you can probably imagine that the contraction of the extrafusal skeletal muscle fiber will lead to stretching of the small intrafusal muscle fibers within the neuromuscular spindle. Now, once again, over here, we can see the muscle spindles, which are attached over here in parallel to the skeletal extrafusal muscle fibers. This is another illustration, which is showing you the same concept over here. The efferent neurons, which are color coded in green over here, they can be seen carrying the information of stretch from the muscle spindles to the central integration center, which is the spinal cord. These efferent neurons bring the information into the sensory gray horn or the posterior horn of the spinal cord. The efferent neurons are basically of two types. They could be type 1A efferent neurons or they could be type 2 neurons. These are shown over here. The type 1A efferents, these are the annulospiral endings, which are basically arising from the center of the intrafusal muscle fibers, the nuclear bag as well as the nuclear chain fibers. Whereas the type 2 efferents are flower spray endings, and you can see them over here arising from the peripheral parts of the intrafusal fiber on either side. Next, the efferent neurons, they arise from the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord and they carry motor impulses to the effector organs, that is the muscle. These efferent neurons are shown in blue and purple over here and the effector organs to which these motor impulses are carried to could be either the extrafusal skeletal muscle fibers or they could be the small intrafusal muscle fibers within the neuromuscular spindle. The skeletal muscle then contracts in order to maintain its length despite the extra stretch which is induced onto the muscle and thus eliciting a deep tendon stretch reflex. Now these efferent neurons as you can see over here these are of two types they could be alpha efferents color coded in blue over here or they could be gamma efferents which are color coded in purple over here about 70 percent of the efferent neuronal fibers are actually alpha efferents and these are uh, going to innervate the larger extrafusal skeletal muscle fibers whereas only 30% of the efferent fibers are gamma efferents, which are smaller in diameter, and they innervate the smaller 
intrafusal muscle fibers which are part of the neuromuscular spindles. Now, in order to understand the functioning of the stretch reflex much better, we need to understand the functioning of the gamma efferents in a bit more detail. The main function of the gamma efferents is that they increase the sensitivity of the neuromuscular spindles to respond to stretch. And we know by now that the neuromuscular spindles are present inside or near the tendons of the large extrafusal muscle fibers. So how do the gamma efferents increase the sensitivity of the neuromuscular spindles to respond to stretch? Let's find out. Now what happens is that there's always some kind of a baseline discharge coming from the muscle spindles at all times. So the neuromuscular spindles are actually uh, sending some kind of an information about the length of the muscle or the rate of change in the length of the muscle to the spinal cord into its posterior horn at all times using these afferent nerve fibers, which could be type 1A or type 2 afferent nerve fibers, which we already discussed. Now, when the skeletal muscle, the extrafusal muscle fiber, they, they get stretched, then there's an increase in the rate of discharge of impulses from the neuromuscular spindle to the spinal cord. And similarly, a decrease in the rate of discharge of impulses from the neuromuscular spindle will be seen when the muscle, when the skeletal muscle is relaxed. Thus, the neuromuscular spindle keeps the central nervous system, that is the spinal cord, informed about the muscle length and the rate of change in the muscle length at all times. So then, in response to this information, the CNS, which is the spinal cord, sends motor impulses to the skeletal muscle and causing the skeletal muscle to contract accordingly, and thus maintaining the muscle tone and therefore we can say that the muscle tone would be a function of the integrity of the reflex arc and that is why if there is any damage to the reflex arc to any component of the reflex arc the muscle tone gets lost and we see hypotonia in other words clinically a flaccid paralysis gets elicited and this is the kind of presentation which we see typically in a lower motor neuron lesion. Now, where do the gamma efferents fit into this picture? Well, if the gamma efferents, which are shown over here, color-coded in purple, if these gamma efferents, they get excited, then this will cause the muscle spindle fibers, the intrafusal muscle spindle fibers, to shorten in length, which increases tremendously their chances to become stretched more quickly by any change in length of the extrafusal skeletal muscle fibers. In other words, making the neuromuscular spindles more sensitive to detect the changes in the length of the large extrafusal skeletal muscle fibers. On the contrary, if the gamma efferents they get inhibited, then the neuromuscular spindles would actually become less sensitive to detect any change in the length of the large skeletal muscle fibers. Several descending motor pathways coming from various higher centers, they influence they influence the reflex arc by causing either the excitation or inhibition of the gamma efferent nerve fibers, or in other words, increasing or decreasing the muscle tone by indirectly exciting or inhibiting the gamma efferent nerve fibers in the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord. Now, there are several other reflex arcs at various levels of the CNS, such as we've got the gag reflex, we've got the corneal reflex in the pons, and we've got the visual light reflex in the midbrain. The gag reflex is seen inside the medulla oblongata. These can be used as part of a neurological examination, such as in a comatose patient, to find out if those specific regions of the central nervous system are working fine or not. For instance, an intact gag reflex would tell us that the medulla oblongata is intact functionally. An intact corneal reflex would probably suggest an intact working pons. And a visual reflex, if that is intact, that could potentially suggest that the midbrain is working fine. The significance of eliciting these reflexes is even much more higher in people who are unconscious, for example, in a comatose patients, because those patients are not able to respond to your questions, which you ask as part of the history taking process. And so therefore, uh, in a reflex arc, we said that the reflexes don't really involve the higher centers, such as the, cor such as the cerebral cortex. And so we don't really need a conscious involvement of uh, the patient to elicit those reflexes. And so we can actually elicit these reflexes without any patient involvement, without any uh, conscious involvement of the patient and we can actually find out if the different regions of the brain stems are working brain stem are working fine or not.
Now, before we start discussing the descending motor spinal pathways in detail, I think it will be beneficial to know the difference between the upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons, and to discuss the difference between the lesions of the upper and the lower motor neurons. So what is an upper motor neuron? The upper motor neuron is a part of the motor system, which is confined to the central nervous system, that is the brain and the spinal cord. It's not gonna be situated inside the peripheral nerves, inside the spinal or in the cranial nerves. For instance, in the schematic shown over here, which we've covered a few slides back as well, we can see the corticospinal tract shown over here in red dotted lines, extending from the cerebral cortex all the way down to the anterior horns of the spinal cord. This is an example of the upper motor neuron, and you can see it is confined within the different parts of the brain and the spinal cord. Similarly, the corticonuclear tracts, which are shown over here with the pink dotted lines, this is an example of an upper motor neuron as well, and it is also confined within the central nervous system. And you can see it extends from the cerebral cortex and goes all the way down to the cranial motor nerve nuclei. Whereas the lower motor neurons include the neurons whose cell bodies are situated either inside the anterior horns of the spinal cord and the neurons then run inside the peripheral spinal nerves, or these could include the neurons whose cell bodies are situated within the cranial motor nerve nuclei, and then, and then the axons of these neurons are going to run inside the peripheral cranial nerve. So the upper motor neurons are confined within the central nervous system, the brain or the spinal cord, whereas the, the lower motor neurons are confined within the peripheral nervous system, which includes either the spinal nerves or the cranial nerves. Now, our higher centers, they influence the reflex arc through various upper motor neuron pathways. The, the medial descending pathways, which are examples of the upper motor neurons, these influence the reflex arc for the axial musculature for maintenance of the body posture primarily. Uh, similarly, the lateral descending pathways, which affect the appendicular musculature, such as the corticospinal tract, the lateral corticospinal tract, that is an example of upper motor neuron as well. Some upper motor neurons are excited some are inhibitory. However, the dominant effect is inhibition on the dominant effect on the reflex arc is that of an inhibition. And that is why whenever there is an upper motor neuron lesion in any part of the central nervous system, we will see a spastic paralysis because that dominant inhibition, the net inhibition is gone and the reflex arc becomes hyperexcitable leading to hypertonia and hyperreflexia. On the contrary, if any component of the reflex arc is damaged, including the lower motor neuron, which is the efferent neuron starting from the anterior horn of the spinal cord running inside the peripheral spinal nerve, if that is damaged, then that would lead to loss of tone, leading to hypotonia and hyporeflexia as part of the clinical neurological examination. So whenever we do a neurological examination in an upper motor as well as in a lower motor neuron lesion, we'll see that the muscle bulk is going to go down in both kinds of lesions and the power is going to go down as well in both upper and lower motor neuron lesions. But how then would we be able to differentiate between the two lesions? Well, the tone and the reflex examination is going to give us a clue as to whether we're looking at an upper or a lower motor neuron lesion. In, a, in an upper motor neuron lesion, we'll see that the tone is going to increase. So we'll We'll see hypertonia and we'll see the reflexes becoming hyper so we'll see hyperreflexia whereas in case of a lower motor neuron lesion the hypotonia or hyporeflexia would be elicited as part of a neurological examination so just to recap in this lecture we've talked about the basic motor system organization we've talked about the different components of the motor system starting from the reflex arc which is the building stone of our motor system then we talked about the corticospinal and corticonuclear tracts briefly uh, mentioning their location inside the bigger hierarchy of the motor system and then we discussed how do the cerebellum and the basal ganglia fit into this motor system organization we discussed in a little bit detail about the about the components of the reflex arc. We discuss what a stretch reflex is and we discuss the gamma efferents in a bit more detail as to how do they maintain the sensitivity of the neuromuscular spindles. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you benefited from the video. If yes, then please do like the video. And in the subsequent lecture on the descending spinal pathways, we'll be actually diving deep into the uh, different descending spinal pathways, primarily talking in a lot more detail about the corticospinal pathways. So see you in another video. Bye for now.